Hi everyone, and welcome to A Gem of a Secret Podcast. My name is Donatella, my secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. How you doing tonight, Coco? Um, actually, so, I, I don't know why I always say, um, actually, so, like, I didn't have it prepared before we actually started filming. Mm-hmm. But today, I'm doing great, actually, in fact, because I had a two-hour anxiety attack at work today. Oh, did you? And I'm no longer having one, so yeah. this is great. Yeah, <laughs> it's always great when you're not having a full-on anxiety attack. Yeah, I, I, yeah. it's awful. Like, I think that it had a lot to do with, um, there's a couple things. I think my medication did it, but it's mm-hmm. also, like, um, it's what happens when you drink a lot, like I do, is you do tend to get anxiety attacks just you easier. Do. Yeah, and so I think that that also kind of contributed to. Yeah. and just oh. I feel like when I'm hungover, like the day after drinking, I get anxiety attacks like especially easier. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was a nightmare. And yeah, <laughs> that or like caffeine is like an extreme anxiety trigger for me. Oh, gosh. Yeah, caffeine is awful. I'm so caffeine sensitive, it's stupid. Me too. And And I used to be a barista. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, Donna, what are you wearing this evening? Oh, you know, uh, this uh, foam that we have on the walls, I decided to make it into a full-on floor-length gown. Um, I (laughs) am really just embracing the podcast life. Yeah. Uh, Hashtag Uh, podcast life on Instagram. (laughs) Uh, Speaking of which, follow us at A Gem of a Secret on Instagram. Yeah, so um, <laughs> in the spirit of promotion, even though you can't see me listeners, I actually just took the word a gem of a secret on Instagram and then I wrote it on a bunch of tiny little pieces of paper, then I shredded those pieces of paper, <laughs> and then I put it back together with glue, and then I made myself a little skirt. Um, that's what that little sh- 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 the sound is. That's me moving. Uh-huh. Um, and then I'm just wearing little a black top, but with a pink blazer, because I'm like feeling myself. I love it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's everything. And I love the sound that, that it makes when it moves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just so great. Just <laughs> Do that, what was that again? Can you move it again yeah, for me? Yeah. And can you sing and, and move it at the same time for me? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have this ability. Um, so uh, what what's really interesting, though, about being drag artists and being in the club scene and being a person who does experience anxiety attacks mm-hmm. is um, I am a professional first and an artist second, like a s- artist second, like I've said on some of their episodes, and I can push through, but for some reason at work, I could not push through. Yeah. Good grief. Well, it, it's crazy how the setting changes that. I, yeah, like you're in a social setting and you're in that sort of dynamic where you have to push through or else you just fall apart in front of everyone. Absolutely. So, but at work, I think, who was it? Kelly Catrone, PR Maven, that said, if you have to cry, leave the room. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Honey, I will cry in front of you. I will <laughs> cry in front of you, honey. You are. <laughs> Oh, man, I will make you and your mother and every person you know uncomfortable. I will put all of that flood of emotion on you. Gosh, I, I, lo- I get off so much on seeing other people get uncomfortable with my tears. <laughs> but I can't cry in front of my husband. It's really weird. Yeah, I, I cry at the drop of a dime. Uh-huh. I really am. I'm a crier. Um <laughs> Donna is a crier. I am such a Sometimes crier. Sometimes it's like not even that sad. I went on a first date recently and I cried on the first date. <laughs> That's just your best foot forward. Yeah, right. No, um, sometimes the conversation just gets gets serious, you know, and then you <laughs> all of a sudden are triggered and uh, have an emotional emotional response. And they started <laughs> crying because your uh, trauma were... <laughs> response was triggering for them. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, I'm, I'm gonna leave now. <laughs> Which then triggered Donna. Um... <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you know, fear of abandonment and whatnot, because <laughs> it's, it's happened a few times to me. There you go. <laughs> so, um, so listeners, so we, um, as we merge into this interview lifestyle, because we have another interview for you here today, we and we're so excited about it, because we get to chat with our friends that we haven't seen um, for many, many weeks or months or in this case days, but <laughs> because mm-hmm. it's, cause it's COVID and yeah. that sucks. Uh, but one thing is if you have a person or if you are a person who would love to be interviewed on our podcast, please just like write us in the comments at a gem of a secret mm-hmm. or follow us on Instagram and shoot us a DM. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's just the way about it, going about it. And then, of course, you can always check us out on our new like page on Facebook, which is a gem of a secret as well. 
Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah, um it's great. We're trying to get more social media um kind of out for this podcast because we're really trying to grow and we're excited to bring on new fun guests for y'all um that are part of this Portland community and um just part of the greater artist entertainer drag queer community abroad. So, um thank you all for um everyone who has tuned in for that last interview we've seen a really good increase in views um because of that episode so we're looking forward to bringing you more content like that yeah and be sure to check out um our last bonus episode that released on monday yes um it's a season uh, season 13 drag race recap kind of impressions episode so look out for that yeah, exactly. And we're going to be doing those throughout the season because there's going to be a lot of Drag Race related content that we can kind of get our hands on. Absolutely. So with that, um, Donna, how are you doing this evening? Oh, Coco, I will let you know after this brief commercial break when we bring our guest on. Do you wear t-shirts? Do you wear a face mask? I sure as hell hope so. Do you put on your silly little t-shirt and your silly little face mask and wish you had something a little more out there? Yes. Even something, dare I say, matching? Girl, yes, duh. Then it looks like HunterDrips.com is exactly what you need. At HunterDrips.com, socially relevant merch and apparel is up for sale. That's never for profit. 50 to 100% of every purchase is donated. I hear they carry matching shirts and masks with designs that say cute little slogans like Defund the Police, Black Lives Matter, and it goes over your nose and even shirts and hats with your own pronouns on them. You know, things that are important. Oh, so you mean important. And almost all of it is donated? Yes, donated, and guess what? What, it's size inclusive too? Yes, up to 5XL. Why just make clothes for skinny people? It's all made by Queer Artist Girl. The creator of HunterDips.com is trans, fat, lesbian, and the site also includes merch from other queer artists, including gay Portland rapper Tono. Listeners, head on over to HunterDrips.com and use the code SECRET for 15% off your purchase today. That's SECRET for 15% off your purchase at HunterDrips.com. It's a podcast with Coco and Donna tell a podcast. Tune into what they tell you podcast with Coco and Donna tell a podcast. Well, Coco, I'm feeling like a real party monster because we have Atlas <laughs> on tonight. Oh my gosh, what a stupid segue. <laughs> well, Coco, one of Coco's questions is where did that handle come from? And I'm guessing it comes from the uh, the movie or the, the documentary or the book that James St. James came up with, right? Or, or where's the origin of that for your Instagram handle? Party X monster. Oh, am I coming on now? Hi. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> you like started introducing me and then just went right into a question. And I was like, <laughs> all right. Hello. Hello. Um, so hi, my name is Atlas. I like yes. she, her pronouns. Um, in case anyone is listening and needs to know that, because you should know that. Um, so Party Monster came from the movie Party Monster obviously um it's uh so when i was 16 years old 16 or 17 i can't remember it's been a long fucking time (laughs) and i've lived so many (laughs) lives since then um when i was like 16 or 17 i watched party monster for the first time i grew up in upstate new york about eight hours north of new york city Mm -hmm. and so when i watched it i was just like i was I I grew up so close to New York that like every faggot in New York state was just like, I'm going to move to New York and be a star. Right. And literally I identified so much with like the storyline minus the whole killing your drug dealer and cutting him up and throwing his body into the river. Um, But everything else was like glamorous and fabulous and queer. And um, I wrote Michael Alec a letter while he was in prison so I wrote him a letter in prison and he responded like I so I so let's get to this first part. So I wrote this letter to him and I was basically just like, I just watched this movie about your life. I'm young. I'm queer. I'm, I'm the only queer person like within like 100 miles of where I live and I get bullied all the time and everyone's fucking homophobic and like, I just want to move to New York and do what you do and like what you did basically like this cheesy (laughs) little love story to a murderer. And, um, 
he responded with, oh my God, thank you so much. Send me some Snickers. <laughs> Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. So what? I spent my foster care allowance on a box of Snickers and sent them to him in prison. Oh my God. And that's I, where Party like Monster comes from. I have <laughs> so much to unpack with even my own therapist about that. Like, <laughs> just, like what? That's what? real. You were 16 that's real. when you were sending Michael Alec a letter in, in from prison? Yeah, I was like 16 or 17 the first time that I watched Party Monster. And then when I was thinking of an Instagram handle, for whatever reason, like, I just... I don't know. I gravitated to that. A lot of people thought that it was. Um, so I've gotten messages in the past when it was like connected to a grinder profile, being like, "Oh, you like meth," but like, no, it's about the movie, definitely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, that whole club kid scene and everything. There was a. Uh, there was a lot of allure to it. You know, it was very artistic, and mm -hmm. you know, despite the issues that it had, the you know, the wide range of them, it was also just like really cool to see that like little bit of history um, portrayed in like the movies and in the books that uh, James St. James and Michael Alec, you know, kind of had their part in. Yeah, it was really nice to see something that like the people who are in it, mm -hmm. like the people mm -hmm. that it's about had us had a part in like explaining exactly. it. Yeah. Because so often we see like movies <laughs> <laughs> uh, movies like um, Stonewall, the new Stonewall oh movie. Oh my god! Gosh, right? I want to watch that. Oh, it's so where all bad. of a sudden, I, don't. I, I think we should. I think that we should have a night where we all get really stoned and watch that movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we should record it and provide commentary on it. And oh it my be gosh! A podcast. But they that like whitewashed it and made it like a little kind of gay straight boy who throws the first. Um, yeah. You know, it just the, we see so often that stories are taken out of just completely away from the people that they are about. Yeah, right. Um, Team. You know, especially for queer people, like we're not taught our culture growing up. We're not the, like at least in some areas of the world. Like I don't know. I didn't know there were trans celebrities until recently. Like back in like the fifties. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know that either until recently as well. When I was at uh, Portland's Pride, mm -hmm. we heard all about Puerto Rico and it was just yeah insane how much inform. I felt so ignorant. Yeah. I felt so ignorant. I was like, wow. I was like, because it's not taught in schools. Like yeah. we all have yeah, a basic not. understanding of certain points of history, even if you fell asleep that day, because it's just like, in your brain it's on every kid's show and whatever but queer history is just it's literally so denied in schools that we have no idea who started what for us <laughs> yeah. exactly in general. i definitely so like i grew up uh my mom is a lesbian and when she was uh when she happened to be in my life because she was in and out of prison and rehab and all of that throughout like my entire childhood um when she was around I was around drag queens and like my first drag show, I think I was like seven or eight years old and I was sitting, eating a Slim Jim and drinking Mountain Dew, watching drag queens at like seven or eight in a bar. Like wow. my mom used to be a really big part of the small queer community that we had in Northern mm -hmm. New York. Wow. Um, and so it was, it. I don't know, I've, I've always been really pleasantly able to like know queer people and like knew that it was okay to be myself based off the people around me, but we're not taught who came before us. No, we're not. We're really not. And that's a shame. And I think that, you know, as time goes on, younger generations will get that. Um, but yeah. It's, oh my God, it's... these younger generations, I, oh, I saw like a trans 12 year old the other day and I just wanted mm. to hit him in the face. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah. Me too. I, I was like, kick those you, little kids across the street. I was like, you little bitch. You had like, but also <laughs> at the same time was like wiping a tear. Wiping a tear away. Just, oh, right? absolutely. So beautiful. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. the funny thing is like, this is an appalling opinion, but I, I get so frustrated. I, it's like, I feel the same way Atlas does, but like the anger inside of me is so full that they have that opportunity because I swear I had so many hurdles without any knowledge or help. And my, my story isn't even that bad. It's just, it was so traumatic 
that it just like drives me crazy when I see a queer kid at Pride whose parents are just super excited about them and they're celebrating this person's existence. And I'm like, I hate well, you. Well, we're millennials. We live yeah. through our shared trauma. Oh. One of my best friends in Portland, her name is Michelle. She is one of those parents. Her child, um, they go by they, them pronouns. I don't know if they've changed their name right now, so I'm not going to say their real name. I'm just going to say they do drag, and their name is Sparkle. Mm -hmm. And um, they've done drag around the city for the last few years um, here and there. But uh, Michelle is one of those parents that was just, like, supportive of her kid. Her kid's doing drag. She's just in love with them. And I lived with them for a little while at one point. And, like, watching that little human so comfortably running around the house in dresses and like wearing pink fur coats to fucking like what is it fourth or fifth grade I literally was like oh my god I hate you so much yeah. <laughs> like I love you and I'm so happy for you but like damn yeah, T, right? Well, because it's kind of sad to think back, like, what our experiences would have been had we been able to be authentic, you know? Yeah, we would have been different people. That's that's, what, exactly. that's the reality. Yeah. I will say, so, so that this whole narrative is not just me punching little kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I will <Let> say <laughs> that the one positive that I've taken out of being, like, a quote-unquote orphan kid, like... My mom was never around. I was in and out. I lived with every single aunt and uncle growing up. I lived oh, with my wow. grandmother for a while. She got old. I went to foster care. And then after 17 was just like on my own in the world. Like one positive that comes out of not having one stable set of people or person that raises you is no one is instilling their fucking values or their views mm -hmm. or their opinions on you because in their eyes they're just helping you survive mm -hmm. right oh, yeah yeah, yeah. So i never oh, lived see. with anyone long enough to ha be told like being gay is wrong yeah wearing girl clothes is wrong and so like i will say that i was and have always been the most flamboyant person from mm -hmm. day one and never tried to hide it and just embraced it all the way through until I was an adult. And then there were moments when I hated myself, but like, <laughs> right. But um, like, yeah, I was really lucky to, no one ever taught me religion. So I'm not really religious. Like I don't really understand religion at all because I never, yeah ever experienced any type of religion no one was trying to make me be more butch or or this or that because they were just trying to take care of a kid like an extra kid in the world to make sure that yeah. that kid was okay no so sense. yeah that's I, a really I, unique perspective too to, to have it's one takeaway that i can have that that is at least positive you know yeah right yeah so sure. let's go back to some of the atlas roots and we're going to talk about florida a little yeah, bit. yeah a little bit before you um so yeah we want to talk about florida and how you ended up from florida to the pacific northwest so let's start from there oh lord okay <laughs> <laughs> um so I'm, well, let's start with like, I moved to Florida from upstate New York and Vermont, which is the area where I started drag and went to high school and all of that. And yeah. then I moved a kind of literally like a ping pong ball, kind of just like pinged from Vermont to uh, West or er, uh, Virginia and then Georgia and then North Carolina and then ended up in Florida. Wow, all over the Right, wow. like I just oh, bounced geez. through the South for like six months at a time until I ended up in Tampa. Yeah. Wow. Dang. Um, so I lived in Tampa until I moved here from probably like 19 or 20 until I was 26 when I moved here. So it was like mm -hmm. the formative years of being a young adult and like out on my own. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I moved to Tampa. I had already been doing drag up in northern New York. Like, not not the most glamorous drag. Like, we used to do a, a fucking drag show at the VFW. Oh, what? my gosh. I, yeah. When I first <laughs> started doing drag, we did mm -hmm. drag shows once a month at the VFW. And, like, the Planned Parenthood moms would come out. And, like, <laughs> like all of the, like, the, yeah, it was ridiculous. But anyways, nice. so I uh, moved to Florida. 
um, I started doing drag, like just for fun here and there. And then there was a, this contest called Queen of the Night that was um, hosted by the mother of the House of Infinity. Mm -hmm. Uh, Her name is Power Infinity. And so um, she hosted this contest and I went and I did the contest and the first night I didn't win. And she she immediately said, you didn't win, but I wanna book you. And Mm. so then that turned into, I did this contest three times. I did a booking for her and I started working at this club called Liquid. Okay. Liquid was, um, I don't know. All of Tampa is a lot more POC than all of Oregon. Like, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. But but Liquid specifically was um, out of all of the queer bars in Tampa and Ybor City, I would say the one that was the most primarily POC and Black and like specifically Latin communities. And so um, I worked there for like four years, the whole four years that they were even open because they had like apparently just open and whatever. You know how bars are. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I like did this contest, worked there for a while and then just like started building myself up. Um, Thank you. I did drag all over the Tampa Bay, St. Petersburg area. I was going to Orlando on Tuesdays and doing um, a performance night at Pulse at one point. Oh, Um, wow. I was, yeah. So I was like right in the depths of it. I did a pageant. I did a couple pageants, actually. My track and everything was very different then. Florida definitely puts you in a pageant package. Oh, for sure. So you to a certain degree, like big hair, nails, pads, all of those things are like necessary. Almost. Sure, that makes sense. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. In a toxic way, yes. (laughs) Yes, in a toxic. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, whatever. (laughs) I literally was like, "What?" I had like pads. Ew, no, not my thing. I'm more of a tampon girl. (laughs) Oh my god. I love having the whole world on a string. Okay. So, um, but no, so I did Tampa Bay Comedy Queen, which is um, a local comedy pageant that then sends you to a national comedy contest. And I won that one year. That was really fun. I went to nationals for that. I am, to this day, I am still the only trans female who has placed top 10 at nationals for Mr. Continental. Wow. wow. Which is like wow. a huge beauty contest yeah. for primarily a, like Brooklyn Heights has won Miss Continental, um, uh-huh. Giselle Barbie Royale, uh, Chantel DeMarco, yeah. like all of these fabulous, fabulous entertainers. Um, but I'm still to this day the only trans female who has placed top 10 at, in the Mr. category because I like did a pageant, won it, went to nationals, and yeah. then now I'm a woman. But yeah, that's so that's exciting. Insane. So you had to be rubbing shoulders with like a lot of big name entertainers being in that scene. Yeah, when I remember my first time going to Georgie's Alibi, which used to be a really big um, neighborhood bar restaurant in um, St. Pete, which is across the river from Tampa or not the river, but like there's like, I don't know, a bunch of salt water in the middle. <laughs> there's a bridge. Sure. And um <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I remember the first time I went there, I met Alexis Mateo for the first time. And it was just after season three. Like it was during the years where people were a batshit fucking crazy over oh, yeah. Drag Race. Yeah. Wow. Right. And yeah. so she was literally just standing on the other side of the room. And Alexis is so put together that the bitch looks <laughs> just like a fucking picture <laughs> or just like she just like she does on TV when you see her in person. And I feel like sometimes you meet a drag race girl and that's not the case. But for some of those girls, they are so polarizingly fucking put together and perfect yeah. that you're just like, holy fuck. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm not oh, worthy. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, I've been damn, there with this some of bitch them. brushes her hair. She, you know, <laughs> she stones her costumes. She's just her face is literally stamped onto her fucking body. It's ridiculous. Mm, yeah. And I so um, I sang in this little karaoke contest they were doing that night. 
met her. She was hosting it. And then after that, she just like kind of gravitated towards me. We gravitated towards each other. Um, she hosted different things around the city. So in Tampa to pay your dues and get better at drag, there are different contests at different hamburger Mary's and different bars each night of the week that are mm -hmm. audience applause and you get a hundred dollars cash and you show up and you sign up and you do the contest and you do that for fucking ever until you get noticed or until you've you know perfected your drag enough yeah mm -hmm. and so i just started doing that doing drag singing doing both and i became kind of entwined with alexis um i know a lot of i i at this point in my life know all of the big name drag performance artists from the Tampa Bay area. Wow. Um, I went on tour at one point with Trinity Taylor um, yeah. for, and we backup danced for the lead singer of Erasure, Andy Bell. Wow. That's insane. Those are like, what? these were just like yeah. random, but like Tampa's drag scene is so big and pageanty and like, it's just, there's so much going on that there's random opportunities like that, you yeah. know? Do you, do you find, just let me pause. Do you find that to be, disappointing a little bit being in the pacific northwest here like in seattle yeah sure maybe but like being in portland like those things don't really exist here like at that level it feels well, before like i go on to like trash talk the entire city on your podcast. oh no go ahead i'll do it for you so portland no, <laughs> um i love this city for so many things too. Yeah. I love, love, love this city for so many things. It's the only place that I've, I've tried to transition three times in my life. This is the first time that it stuck and that it worked. Um, I can like, it, it's, I feel like I can exist here in a way that you cannot exist as a trans woman in a, almost any other part of the country in, in certain ways um, mm -hmm. when it comes to just the city. I will say that in my experience of being in Portland, I wish that we could all maybe stop with the drama and create more opportunities for each other and not yeah. gatekeep so much. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like gatekeeping is. And I mean that there. in like the realest fucking sense. I mean, anyone that knows me knows that I'm going to speak my mind and my opinion is going to be what it is. Well, actually, I want to touch on that. That's actually really interesting because you literally just shared a story about how if you wanted to pay your dues, you know, you did these contests at, you know, the Hamburger Marys or, you know, just bars at that level, you, you know, stepped your junk up and then you like so got noticed and then you were in other circles. I feel like that path doesn't quite exist here because yeah because um, even like with catch a rising star which is uh like a season of that show happens where it's like an open call stage and whatever and i know that's like how syra got to be on cast at mm -hmm. darcells and I think whatever that it, but i think that it does same. happen some in some ways here and there yeah, I, mm -hmm. I could agree with right? that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I could agree with we're that. We're also I, a smaller city. We're a smaller mm -hmm. city. We're a smaller community. Like, yes, every Halloween, there's like six new drag queens in Portland. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, very that. Very that. But, um, or like during Pride, there's six new drag queens in Portland. But like mm -hmm. in the Tampa Bay area, it's like every week somebody douches and a new drag queen appears. Yeah, so you have to like stay on top. Like mama's in, the, mama's in the bathroom with her shower shot getting ready yeah. for the trade. <laughs> and then all of a sudden there's another human in the room and it's a cross dresser. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's very that. Very that. Oh my gosh. So let's have you respond to that drama that happened with Trinity to the top. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. I mean Oh no, she said she wanted to be surprised by questions. Oh no, I'm I'm so I'm an open book. You can ask me yeah. anything. I honestly at this point in my life, I what the best thing that's come from transitioning is that I love me so fucking much and I have am no longer like afraid to say what I think. You know what I mean? As long yeah. as it's not like racist or sexist or like abusive, mm -hmm. I'm going to yeah. say what my opinion is. And like, I'm also going to talk the truth because this is my fucking life and I have nothing to hide. Yeah. T. Um, but so 
the Trinity thing. So uh, I was approached by her. She she and I met because she worked at Lancome or whatever. I forget some. I think it was Lancome. I think it was Lancome. Lancome or Estee Lauder maybe. Um, but she worked at a makeup counter and she was uh, also doing drag or whatever. And my partner at the time, his name is Jason. He um, is the only ex I have that I'm friends with to this day for whatever reason. Um, he worked at the makeup counter and they knew each other. So I hadn't really met her except for I'd seen her, you know, fully naked body and nothing but rhinestones and like gorilla glue tape um, all over the city, right? And uh, so she approached me and said, hey, I have this opportunity. Um, Andy Bell from Erasure is going on tour and he would like some backup dancers. It started as just one performance at Parliament House for New Year's. That was Mm -hmm. the first gig. Mm -hmm. I had also just in the last two years gone from being a nobody to being like everywhere. Oh, cool. There was this like blow up moment where I went from just being in one place and no one really knew who I was to just being all over the fucking Tampa and St. Petersburg and like Sarasota, like the whole circuit. I was performing everywhere. I was doing shit everywhere. And I will acknowledge that I took advantage of the free drinks and the cocaine and the, the party lifestyle of being the new it girl. Oh, absolutely. As, we absolutely. Do. As you do when you're a young entertainer, you know, like that, that is part of the culture. I was also like, for the first time in my life, making my own choices and my life was not being dictated by like being in foster care or being pushed away by people. It was like, I took my, I took myself and was like, I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. And so uh, I was definitely just like making some very questionable choices on like a regular basis and (laughs) like a real regular basis. (laughs) She's Mm -hmm. like, this was tea. Mama. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's like that one girl in portland who always has to walk up to you the moment you walk into the club and says do you have any coke oh my god i bet you're all, both thinking of different names than i am you right like oh, yeah. but anyways, both the I same and different yep. yeah yeah I'm not gonna lie but i digress so anyways i uh was asked to do this show i was asked to do this show and i said yeah absolutely so i choreographed the whole thing oh cute i started choreographing all of these numbers. And then they, we pulled in Chantel Sparkles, who at the time was living in Sarasota. And her and I like <laughs> were like kind of flirtatious when we were around each other, but she had a partner. And like it it very much seemed as if Trinity had set this up and we were her like backup girls. We were like the backup, mm. backup dancers. That's, okay. mm, I don't know if I like mm. that. And so we did this whole thing. We went to this New Year's show. It, we were like the closing act at this New Year's show at Parliament House with the lead singer of Erasure. We had done all of this work for months, right? And I got nervous and I definitely had maybe one or two or three extra drinks. Yeah. Right. I got all of, uh, now listen, I on stage was fine. I did my part. I knew my pieces, everything. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, I got really drunk because it was just like, it all had hit me, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. And um, we were coming down the stairs and I fell. (laughs) I tripped. (laughs) We're like waiting. We're like, like, I fell. And kind of dark. And we were like rushed off the stage. I tripped and fell. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, and then two weeks later, we went to Houston. And the stairs coming out of the dressing room were literally vertical. And I hadn't drank anything. And I fell down the fucking stairs again. Oh, God. So that's twice in two weeks. Yeah. And they just kind of, I, I noticed that people were like pulling away. And it seemed as if, you know, maybe they had a, a, a different idea of who I was than what I thought that I was putting off. Yeah. And sure. then it just so happened that I don't have, I didn't have a passport and they both did and they were going overseas to do shows. And so we just kind of went our separate ways and that was it. And it was, yeah. I didn't see it as any drama. I didn't see any drama while we were there. Like we went to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, 
and it was just me and Chantel and Chantel and I had a fucking blast and she, she we were like together part like mm-hmm. having the best fucking time like I have some stories I could tell you not on a podcast and <laughs> cuz I'm like again I'm not going to talk shit about someone on a podcast that can't defend themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, I'm just going to say my side of a story. Yeah. Right. How did you feel when it got all judged up this summer? Well, I think it was just really annoying that, like, you have this gigantic platform with so many people listening. And you took out of all the things that you could talk about, you decided to talk about someone from, like, almost 10 years ago. Yeah. Like, eight years ago. Like like six to eight, maybe ten years ago, you're you're like bringing that up, and all you have to say is, "Oh, girl, she was a mess. She was an alcoholic. She was this and she was that." There was no reason to to do that. Like, yeah. I don't know you. I don't know mm-hmm. who you are anymore. We went in different yeah. directions. So, like, why are you so sore about that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and For what's real. also really problematic about what I think what was happening in that moment is that some people tell these stories so nonchalantly. Like when me and Donna talk about being from Junction, I actively know that like it could potentially piss somebody off and I am choosing not to care. What I felt like Trinity was doing was specifically like, oh, I'm just going to recite this story and not care about the damage it could do because of the platform I have. Yeah, like, that's absolutely. What was problematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree with that completely. But yeah, so it just—I don't know. It—it it was just like annoying to me that like you would bring that up, and then I had like hundreds of people mes- messaging me, being like, "Oh my god, they're talking shit about you. They're talking shit about you." Blah 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 blah. And then when I responded and like wrote them a both a message, just being like, "Hey, I'm not that person anymore." Mm-hmm. And Jeez. the way that you're saying it is as if I still am. And you're also in, like, you also made like a shitty comment of like, oh, who cares where she is now? Like if, even if in that moment, eight years ago, we left in a weird place, I have lived a million different lives since then. And I've grown and I've changed. I've literally gotten tits now, you know, like. We definitely love this version that we see in front of us. And yeah. I think it's titties. 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 Yes. Um, um, listeners, Atlas just flashed us. Yes, our if tits. only there were a visual component. Maybe we'll start an OnlyFans for our podcast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and Donna can put all the first trap photos that, up there. That right there. God, I love that. So um, the thing is, so let's talk about, let's talk about where we live. Cause like all the listeners here who live in Portland, who listen to us are like, can you talk about us for a second? And no, we're not going to talk about you, but. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, so you, um, let me just end that whole thing. Yeah. Oh, saying. sure. Go ahead. Let's wrap. Yeah. No, you're fine. Um, we were talking about Tampa to Portland originally, right? Yeah. Correct. So, mm-hmm. I broke up with like, this is years later, long story short is that I broke up with Jason was in a very tough spot, tried to transition for the second time in my life, was living with two trans women who were like my best friends. I used to be a part of this really beautiful community of trans girls and cross dressers and like drag queens. And we all hung out together. And on Tuesdays, we would call it Tranny Tuesday. And we would all get dolled up and we would go trounce around Ybor City and drink and dance and like get on the bar at Coyote Ugly and like celebrate ourselves. That's lovely. That's if so if fun. I could get just a little piece of that in Portland, bitch, yeah, just a little. Like I've been meeting so many more trans women recently, and I'm like, bitch, when do we get to have a girls' night? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, because sometimes it just feels very secluded and like I don't know, you feel alone in certain ways. But anyway, so that didn't work out. I continued to be a boy. And I was doing nothing with my life. I spent a whole summer driving all over the state of uh, Florida with my friend Danny Daniels, who is like a famous trans porn star um, and was like her assistant, I guess you would say, and just like went with her places and like, I don't know, basically was just there to help her, but also had like a free fucking summer of just like crazy. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, I wasn't doing anything with my life. My friends made me do a karaoke contest. I won first place, came or went to Arkansas for nationals, met a girl that lived in Portland. She offered me a job. I went home. 
I sold everything that I owned, and then I moved to Portland. Holy shit. What job did you get offered? I just was working for her karaoke company. That's what? In- that is so crazy. That's and that's crazy. how my whole doing karaoke even started. Yeah. When I moved to Portland, I moved here to be a karaoke host. Wow. Oh, my God. And I looked kind of like Donna. <laughs> like, like I don't really grow facial hair, but right now I'm trying it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for real. Very that, and like plaid and hats and scruff yeah. and like all of those things. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so I moved to Portland to be a karaoke host, and it, I didn't start doing drag here until like I don't know eight months into living here. Really? Um, yeah. But you had traveled all around. You've traveled all around the country doing drag. And then you also had, um, just because I'm just monopolizing, you also had stint with reality TV, though, too. Yeah. Hadn't you on some on some uh, singing competition? Shows? Or at least tried out for them and got, like, not eliminated first? <laughs> so <laughs> um, when I was 18, I was on American Idol. Wow. I made it all the way. It was right out of high school. Um, I... Went and auditioned in New York City. I slept outside for two days. I Then I went down and sang in the auditorium full of people and, like, got the ticket. I had auditioned, like, two years. I had, like, before that. Um, I went to Hollywood, or I went and sang in front of the judges. They all said yes. I went to Hollywood. I made it all the way through Hollywood Week down to uh, – 36 people and then they sent us to a mansion where we had to sing against each other (laughs) and i made it through that what and then i sang on national television in front of like millions of people and then simon cowell made a really homophobic comment and that night they received a bunch of emails from like glad and all these things being like you can't you, you like you guys are picking on this person for being flamboyant and blah 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 and um the next day i was gone and i think that a lot of that had to do with it just they were just like because they didn't, yeah. you didn't get enough votes bitch yeah you didn't get enough so what season was this that was season eight with adam lambert damn you were on the same season as adam lambert yes i just feel like this is what kills me. I find it to be... So we were just listening to... Monet was going over... I didn't realize this, by the way. Uh-huh. We were watching this thing where Monet is going over her audition tapes. And two years of her audition tapes were in Portland, right? Yeah. And, like, she was just talking about these things. And, like, it, and like <laughs> it was so fascinating to me. Because it feels like people end up in Portland because they want to be here because it's beautiful. It is. It's a great place to live. But it's like they move away to like get their shot or they came here after getting their shot. It's like it feels like so in between sometimes. Yeah. When it, it comes to it, the draft this was, fields. This was such a random thing too. Like yeah. I randomly ended up here. Um, yeah. I don't know. It is. But why very... didn't you leave? Why didn't you leave? Why did you stay? Let's let's. What kept you here? What kept you here? Uh, For the first time, I think, in my entire life, I built roots, like, legitimate roots with people. Mm. And it wasn't just, like, and it had nothing to do with, like, a partnership. Because my first partner, like, that relationship was really toxic and abusive on both sides. Sure. Um, You know? So, like, I made legitimate friendships. Like, there was a time when I when I first started doing drag in Portland and I like won dragathon and was like, again, that come up moment, that moment yeah. of being like, right. I'm that bitch. I'm not like, I'm here to legitimately play the, the same game as y'all mm-hmm. kind of thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, me, Flawless Shade, ugh, I love her so much. Um, (laughs) I will have a big giant boner crush for Flawless for the rest of my life. I'm just going to say it. I love that human so much. Um, Me, Flawless Shade, (laughs) Autumn Rain's Heart, Missy Nana, and Sativa Goddamn Jones hung out every single fucking day. 
I remember hearing about these. I keep outs. hearing about yeah, those. I remember hearing about those. Every single day. We hung out all the time. We went to these these martini nights. And we also, so did my ex that I was with at the time. And we would just go out all the fucking time. And it was my first time in my life that for like these these relationships were like deep. Yeah. In a mm-hmm. different way. Yeah. Right. And like, I don't know, the hustle and bustle of Tampa and like being so like just drunk and fucked up all the time really just like it felt nice to be in a place where it felt more sophisticated honestly in ways like (laughs) oh we're elevated it's not just like like if you've ever been to LA or Arizona or Florida where it's just flat and one level everything and it just for, I don't know. There's something about the taller buildings here and the rain that makes it feel more like a city in certain ways. It does. I like the fact that it feels like a big city and it's really small and I can get around and I can meet people and I can know things. Like I just, it was, it's just been interesting. Like and in I that feel regard. Like there are so many people from all over the place here that when we all come together, especially queer people, very colorful queer people from all over, whether they flood their small towns like I did, um, or mm-hmm. or you know, were on American Idol when they were 18, like you are. Um, yeah. like there's a lot of colorful people here that aren't afraid to talk about their experiences and their trauma. And I think that makes it unique from a lot of other places. Yeah, because you know, there's there's a lot of transplants here. There are. Like, think no, that's what absolutely. It is. There is. There's a and lot it of. Feels safe. And there's a lot of people that come and go, I feel like, yeah. too. I've had a lot of people, I've made friends with a lot of people who are just like, oh, I'm just here for a moment and then they're gone. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. I've had some that. of those too. Oof. I've only been here that, for two years. Like, I, I wish that, that that was as easily accessible for me, like, in ways. Yeah. Like, um, but yeah, no, I don't know. I stayed in Portland because it, I feel like. The friends that I have in Florida are amazing and beautiful, Mm -hmm. but like I was on a different wavelength and I obviously was like, I needed to find myself. I needed something to change so that I could literally figure out who I was and forcing myself to come to a city where I knew absolutely not a single fucking person seemed like the best idea. Yeah. 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 And it worked. That kind of fits. It fits with how I see how you operate. Um, me and Donatella, because we gave no backstory because we do interviews terribly. Me and Donatella, actually Donatella met Atlas at Valentine's Karaoke from what mm-hmm. I remember. Um, and, you know, we used the same karaoke software um, at the same time. And so when I got to town, Donna was like, you need to meet Atlas. Like she even mentioned like maybe wanting to like, you know, when she's out of town or something like, you know, need some backups for karaoke so she can effing leave and go on vacation for five seconds. And we're like, oh, cool. So I remember I went And I remember the second time I went was you standing on a table talking about how you tried to transition three times and you were celebrating the fact that you are so in love with who you are becoming and you were on a table screaming it to everyone that was in the bar. And I was like, this is the best place to live. And she wasn't even drunk, mind you. She knows how to make a first impression, doesn't she? Yeah, I was like, oh my. I was like, she's phenomenal. I was like, I love her. I was like, oh, we didn't ask, where did the name Nene Dominatrix come from? Oh, okay. So growing up, my mom, uh, one of her really good friends, his name, his boy name was Nathaniel. My dead name is Nathaniel. Um, And then he also was a drag queen named Miss Nene. And she sang live. And she just, I don't know, was like one of my first, like, personal interactions with a drag queen and so when I started doing drag I was like I want to take her name instead of taking like a last name I'm gonna just take her name because why not you know and then um dominatrix just came from the fact that I loved leather I love I love hot fucking strong women like, I think me, about that word. I think too. about that now. Like, at the time, I was like, oh, I'm so fucking cool. My name is Nene Dominatrix. That <laughs> name is fucking sickening. It's the most sickening fucking name. Nobody, nobody is going to be a sickening. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, when you were like, my name's Donatella, my secrets. Exactly. And bitch, that's the best name ever. 
I'm, and, I'm like a femme fatale that stepped right out of a film noir. Yeah. Like, I, I felt like I was living the fantasy. <laughs> but seriously. So my like, name was never fierce enough for that. But like now, now I look at it and I'm like, oh, I fucking love sexy, strong fucking women who just like break the wills of men. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I like, think fuck them up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, for me, it comes from a place where I was told to taught to be ashamed of my femininity from my upbringing. So now I feel more empowered to embrace like that strong feminine aspect of myself. Um, and I always, <coughs> even as a kid, loved like female, fem, like femme fatales in like Kill Bill and oh, Bond bitch, movies, yes. Bond girls, you know, like all of that. Um, I like a I like a villain. I yeah. like the villains, the female villains, like yes. fucking Catwoman, Selena yeah. Kyle going batshit crazy and her oh, and yeah. like getting electrocuted and shit. Like, oh god. Yeah. Yeah. Girl, yeah, T, absolute T. So we want to ask you the same question that we asked Katya. We know that you can hold your own, um, but if you were ever in a bar fight, <laughs> what queens would you want on your side uh, in the Portland scene? Yeah, what other drag entertainers would you want on your side? If I was in a bar fight? Yeah. Yeah, and it has to be Portland or Oregon entertainers. Olivia yeah. Carmichael's. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Because, oh, no, but literally, oh, literally, God. okay. <laughs> but listen, though, listen. Have y'all ever, have y'all ever seen that bitch just a little bit upset? Uh, uh, well, no, no, actually, no, no. Because, like, she doesn't voice her upsetness ever unless you, like, have hung out with her on a, on even just an inkling of a personal level. And then sometimes she, like, will open up and give you, like, the, oh, my God, she's just fucking amazing. Yeah. But so you don't ever see her upset, bitch. Which no. means mama pushed her to that fucking limit. And it's gotta be a dark place. <laughs> She's oh gonna God. fucking, she, she, like, ooh, those bitches <laughs> that are like super, super just genuine, good, nice people, that's the bitch you want in a bar fight because if it gets to that point, mama, she gonna snap. It's gonna be like <laughs> over. <laughs> it's over. True. So I would say Bolivia Carmichael's for sure. Okay. Um, oh, that's so funny. That. So funny. Um, <laughs> God. Definitely click the icon. Oh, yeah. Click. Actually, I could see click being real scrappy, I and I don't know why. Yeah. Well, so we're both from Florida, and I know this because we both wear a white line under our eyes. <laughs> 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 it's literally a floor. It's like a Southern thing to do your makeup with just a white line under your eye for no yeah. reason at all. And um, no, she just, I can tell that that bitch, w she's probably got like a razor blade, honestly, in her cheek right now. <laughs> yeah. You would adopt a drag child like that. By the way, listeners, click the icon is Atlas's drag daughter. Yes. <laughs> T-H-A, honey, T-H-A. Yeah, click the icon. The. <laughs> Seriously, that's so funny. Um. Yeah, I think, I don't know. I. It's so funny. I'm such a scrappy bitch. And like, if you push me to that point, I absolutely will fuck. Like, I'm not I, I'm not afraid to admit that. Like, I till the end of my day, I know that if you put me in a position where I have to get physical, bitch, I'm going to be okay. Like, when I got yeah. jumped last year by those dudes, the one dude definitely walked away with, a like, a broken nose. There's no way that he didn't. Because I was smashing his face into my knee. Like, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I, but at the same time, I don't, when I think of like actual physical violence now, I get like so anxious. <laughs> I'm just yeah. like, ooh. Oh no, you're becoming one of us. Well, you can't, don't you break my boot. Maker. Like this, yeah. this body is getting more expensive and more delicate. Exactly. So it's like, I, I don't want to pop anything. OHP <laughs> paid for them. I don't want to have to replace them. I can't afford right. to, so. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up because like, I remember us having the conversation that it is so wrong to be physically violent or actually even too verbally aggressive with somebody. Because back in the day when somebody would cross you stupid, you like, you know, even in, in the drag community, it's very common too, where you're like, okay, we're going to take this outside. You beat the girl down for being stupid. And then she learns her lesson and doesn't act stupid anymore. But now we have to try a thousand and a half ways. And everybody is always like, 
why can't y'all just be friends? I'm like, Mama. because she's stupid and she needs to get oh smacked God. in the mouth. Literally, <laughs> like, I think a lot of the drama that happens in Portland, if you put those two bitches in a room or in the middle of the street and let them beat the fuck out of each other. <laughs> it would probably solve a lot of things. Honestly. It's done. No, no calling, no calling the police afterwards. Like living on the in the south, bitch. In the south, if a bitch has a problem with you, you hit. She hits you. You don't get a warning text. You, don't get a, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Mama's not gonna be like, I made a Facebook status about you. Like, yeah. Like, you know what I mean? like that's not gonna happen. She's gonna Little walk up on shit. you. Oh my god! She's never, gonna get that you. Is so fucking true. You're yeah. gonna get got, and then after you get got. You then learn your shit. You don't call the police because if you call the police, all your friends are going to beat your ass now. Yeah. 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 We talked about, I I super agree. I really, really do. And then it's Um, over with and then it's done. And while you walk around town with your fat lip and your black eye for three days and can't do anything about it and people are staring at you at the same time, you're learning your fucking lesson. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like <that's, laughs> I'm saying it like it's like like I'm like I'm so hood but like re- I mean I don't know that's just it seems like it would solve a lot of bullshit <laughs> for real for tea so um so it is kind of towards the end of our episode and we don't obviously want to end it on Atlas thinks we should beat each other in the streets <laughs> or so... punching little kids we went from punching yeah. little kids Gosh, to beating I know. people <laughs> This has been, you know, this I'm not a a super aggressive person. (laughs) No, you're not. I know you're not. And it's, it's interesting. So I actually wanted to say this. So Atlas and I um, were recently involved in some private scandal. And one thing that me and Atlas were talking about uh, specifically when this airs, this will have been about like roughly four or five days ago, uh, about forming a collective for our home bar. And I love the thing about that. I love about this idea that Atlas has been saying for literally probably at this point probably a couple months at this point about our home bar doing this was so we can have a better opportunity for ourselves and the bar and growing as a community of drag entertainers because I do sometimes feel really disjointed in the drag scene here I feel like it really is sometimes it feels like everybody's out for themselves and so Alice was like I feel like we should come together as people who perform at this space often to like talk and talk to the bar owners and talk to bar management and plan things and like be a community, be a collective. And I was so about this idea. And Atlas has been saying it since like day one um, with the same home bar. And I really wanted to give her kudos on that because um, Atlas is incredibly talented listeners. I'm going to actually tag some videos of her on our website at agemmasecretpodcast.com so you can just see how talented she actually is. She's an amazing singer, but she's also just a great dancer and it's intimidating and I don't like it. So I don't book her often because of it. Cause I'm like, Oh God, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> I will never measure up, um, <laughs> but say nice things about Atlas. I love you. <laughs> I really do. I, I've, I'm glad that I've gotten uh, closer to you as I've lived here because you are someone who's taught me a lot. And me too. Um, we've had some moments throughout this pandemic where I've gotten to open up to you and get close to you. And I just, I want you to know that I appreciate everything you do. And I appreciate having you in my life. And uh, thank you for coming on this podcast and supporting me. Yeah. Um, do you can have I any say final one words? last thing? Oh Man, yeah. Like a final thought. Yeah. Yes, you please. Brought, you brought up what you said. And I just, so this year I'm trying to be more vocal with um, my opinion on things. I've been doing this a long fucking time and there comes a moment like, no, I haven't just been doing this in Portland. Right. I've only been in Portland for four year, five years now, like, mm-hmm. but I've been doing this a lot fucking longer. And sometimes people, overlook um, that, overlook that, like, or or don't listen to my opinion. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that I am a woman. Mm-hmm. Women are talked over all of the time, right? So I'm trying to be better about um, talking and speaking my piece on, on things. And honestly, my biggest thing is I've worked a lot of shows in Portland. Um, after everything happened with Nightlight, where it just felt like we were painted this picture that we were a family and that we all were allowed to make mistakes. 
um, and that we were growing and building together at all times. And like the, the, the falsity in what I was being like information that I was being given by like the producers of the show that wasn't being correlated to the other girls. I decided I'm done with that. Sure. I'm done with that. If, if I'm going to be throwing shows in a space and you're throwing shows in a space, we should fucking like be on, on board with each other. Something mm-hmm. in Florida that like the girls support each other. The girls promote each other. They're consistently like showing up and there's, there's a fucking sisterhood in it. T. And it doesn't seem like that here a lot, but I want to create that. I want us to be able to work together as a collective mind of really talented, artistic people coming together because we all one want to make money two because we love it. And like, also we're going to die someday. So why not create a legitimate space that isn't going to fucking disappear the moment that you croak? Yeah. Agreed. Why not create something that's going to create space for other people? Yeah. And not also hold each other accountable and and not get messy on the internet and be able to form enough of a bond with someone to talk to them in person. Yeah. T. For real. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like that's I a just really good message. There's there's a lot of a lot of fucking crazy shit that's happened this year. And a lot of us have lost so much. And it's going to last even longer, right? Like this, the, even if everyone was vaccinated tomorrow, so much of that is going to just continue to happen for a while because the damage is already done. Yeah. I want to challenge my friends and my colleagues and the people that I love to be better for each other. Mm-hmm. Have more yeah. respect for yourself to have hard conversations and not blast people all over the internet, not make false accusations because you're frustrated. Yeah. Like mama, go outside, go get out of your apartment, go outside, live your life. Mental health instead of taking it out on other people. Yeah. Agreed. But yeah, so I just want to create it. I want to help facilitate creating a space that is collectively positive and good for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, listeners, that brings us to the end of our episode. Um, Atlas, tell the kids how they can follow you. Um, down the street, but not too close. And where am I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I'm walking away now. <laughs> okay. um, oh, my goodness. No, so you can, um, you can follow me on Instagram. It's partyxmonster. We've come full circle. We're having that wow. moment. Right? Um, Party <laughs> X Monster on Instagram. Um, and you can go on onlyfans.com forward slash J A D Y N Daniels, Jaden Daniels, and subscribe to my OnlyFans and stare at my boobs. Because I'm going to subscribe. Um, Sex okay. work deserves to be seen and <laughs> trans does. women's bodies just deserve to be normalized and seen as beautiful and valid and not gross and disgusting. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. This is so great. So thanks everybody for watching. We are do we are hoping to have more amazing interviews like we had with Atlas today. Mm-hmm. Um, we're Thank you so much Atlas for doing this for us. Yeah, this was amazing. And uh, thanks for coming on and being a part of this platform. We definitely appreciate it. If you ever, ever need me for anything else, you know, you can reach out. I love and adore you. We will. We absolutely will. We love you. Bye. 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 This has been another episode of HM of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of HM of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Jim Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at The Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a J E M of a secret podcast.com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. 
please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye.